We are certainly thankful to be able to come together again to worship our Father in spirit and truth. If you can have the light sign up here, that would be fantastic. And if you have your Bible, open it up, please, to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to begin our study there in verses, thank you, verses 19 through 21 in just a moment. Thank you so much for being here tonight. As you're turning there to Galatians chapter 5, I want to take you back last year. It was a very tough time. It was a phone call I will not forget from another family member where I was informed that one of my uncles had died. He had died of an overdose of drugs. As I look back at my family and the broad family that uh, I've grown up with throughout the years and been a part of, sadly drugs have, been a, have played a big impact upon our family. Uh, there have been drug dealers that have stopped at some of my family's homes. There have been threats that have been made, family relationships that have been destroyed. And guilt has weighed down many family members as a result of the use of drugs by some. And it's not just merely with drugs. Alcohol has played a big part in my family, and not for the better, but for the worse. My father was an alcoholic. I've shared this before here at West Main a number of times, and I've shared it in different places as well. And, uh, you know, it, it ruined his life. It, it ruined his marriage and relationship with his children. And this sermon on drugs and alcohol is a sermon that's more than just curiosity with respect to questions. There's a great warning for all of us. In fact, when you think about the works of the flesh in Galatians chapter 5, Paul is warning the saints in Galatia. In Galatia, uh, Galatians chapter 5, the churches of Galatia, in Galatians 5, beginning in verse 19, he says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident which are immorality, we talked about that last week with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, those are two words that will be a part of our study here in just a few minutes, along with sorcery as well, and things like these of which I forewarn you. So Paul has warned these Christians before, just as I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. These are topics, these are sins, these are behaviors, these are practices, and things like these. So it's not an exhaustive list that, if not careful, will keep us out of the kingdom of God, will keep us out of being with our Father in heaven in eternity. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. You see the contrast? You see the difference about those who are going to follow the words of the Holy Spirit versus the works of the flesh. By the way, next week, Lord willing, I'm going to talk about gambling. And I want you to start thinking about this from Galatians chapter 5. How might Galatians 5, 19 through 21, help us to answer the question with respect to gambling? I want you to think about that personally this week. So I want to talk now, though, about drugs and alcohol. This is not just an argument from emotions, me telling you my story and what's happened in my life. Let's go back to the Word of God and let's see what the Bible has to say. As I was thinking about this and put this together, I first want to talk about drugs. And I guess we can describe them with respect to questions that, may, that people may have putting drugs into three different categories, and that, if that makes sense, and the motives behind what people are doing with respect to drugs and why they are using drugs. Notice that he uses the term uh, sorcery. I'm reading from the New American translation in verse number 20. He uses the term sorcery, and the King James, the word witchcraft, is used. And it comes from the Greek word pharmakia, which sounds like a word that we are all familiar with, with which derives from the term pharmakon, and the original term had to do with medicine, like an ointment or a potion, whether for good as used by a physician or for evil, for poison. And so with the passing of time, the term came to be associated with pagan ceremonies, uh, sometimes in connection with the use of drugs. And the term could simply take on the sense of charm or spell or incantation or enchantment. 
And it's interesting when you go back to verse number 20, that you have idolatry and you have sorcery right next to each other. There's going to be some interaction and, and, and some similarity between the two with respect to the sorcery that certainly would be connected to paganism. And so the use of drugs connected to paganism, to sorcery, to idolatry, these inducing spells or magical drug-induced spells or even poisoning of individuals is condemned in the word of God. Both witchcraft and sorcery and things that are connected to those um, elements and actions are condemned in both the Old Testament and also in the New Testament. In fact, Moses spoke about this in Exodus chapter 22, verse number 18, as did John as he wrote in Revelation 21 and verse number 8 with respect to sorcery and witchcraft. And so as you think about drugs and the use of drugs and why people may have been turning to different uh, medicinal type things and how they were using them, well, this kind of behavior here obviously uh, is condemned in the Word of God. But there's another category that we could talk about. Let me just wrap this up here. The use of drugs connected to paganism with what I just said, that is specifically condemned. As you think about drugs, however, another category we have to think about, and that is for medicinal purposes. Uh, I currently am on some pharmaceutical medication. Many of us are for a variety of reasons. Do we have authority from God? Is that lawful and appropriate for Christians to use medicines or drugs for medicinal purposes? Well, the answer to that is yes. And there's a passage that gives us some clarity, I think, with this, where we have an apostle dealing with a brother who had some physical ailments over in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse number 23. Now, here in the context, Paul is going to refer to wine, but I believe this gives us insight not just with wine, but also with respect to medicinal purposes or drugs as we talk about this subject here. Uh, there's not a lot of information here. We have this verse, and I find it interesting in the context. Paul is talking about a variety of things, about widows and about how to treat widows, about elders and how to honor and respect elders and the work that they do, about sin and how sin is going to be uh, exposed at some point in time. And then in verse 23, he, he tells Timothy something personal. He tells Timothy in verse 23, no longer drink water exclusively. I'm reading from the New American translation. Some may just say no longer drink water, but use a little wine. Or it's an ellipsis, not merely this, but also that. No longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. There was something wrong with Timothy. There was something wrong with his body. I would add this. It's not a part of the lesson, but we see also that Paul's not going to perform a miracle for Timothy. There was something wrong with his body, but he's not going to use that power to do that. But he is going to tell him, here's what you need to add to what's happening right now in your life. You add or use a little bit of wine. And so the wine here would have been used beyond just the use of an antibacterial treatment for the water, there's some medicinal purpose that this wine is being used for, for the frequent ailments that Timothy was experiencing. And so Paul is giving him instruction, and he does have to tell him to, to take some of this for the purpose of whatever was ailing him at that time. We have other examples of things like wine in particular that was used for medicinal purposes purposes. If you look over in Luke chapter 10, the example of the parable of the Good Samaritan, remember in Luke chapter 10 and verse number 33 and 34, what the man who viewed the Good Samaritan the proper way that Jesus wanted him to, or wanted everyone to with respect to their neighbors, how he's going to take care of this individual here. In verse number 30, Jesus replied, the question, who is my neighbor? He replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among robbers and they stripped him and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. And by chance, a priest was going down on that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, the Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. Notice what it says in verse 33 and 34. But a Samaritan who was on a journey came upon him, and when he saw him, he felt compassion and came to him, banded, banded up, bandaged up his wounds, 
pouring oil and wine on them. So he's using this wine for a medicinal reason or purpose to help this individual who was in need, put him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. So there are times where certainly, yes, things like wine is going to be used for medicinal purposes. In fact, there's actually a lot of examples in the Bible, even in the book of Proverbs. We won't look at those today, but there are other examples. Uh, The use of balm, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, I've already had some challenges with saying myth. Sasquatch, is that right? All right, and now we got to add another word. So I got to go back to speech therapy here at the age of whatever. Anyway, we have examples of this where this was something that was sowed and used for medicinal purposes. We find it actually throughout the Old Testament. Look over in Genesis chapter 37 and verse number 25. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 25. There's three examples I'll just share here with you real quickly in Genesis 37 and verse 25. And then we'll go over to Jeremiah chapter 8 and another passage in Jeremiah. And the reason why I'm just sharing this here is that we do see throughout the Bible uh, different uh, medications or drugs used for, um, for the body to help people. And so in Genesis 37 and verse 25, uh, Genesis, I'm in uh, chapter 38. Let me get back to chapter 37. Then they sat down to eat a meal, and as they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilead with their camels bearing aromatic gum and balm and myrrh on their way to bring them down to Egypt. This was something that would have been sold uh, throughout that time. In Jeremiah chapter 8, Jeremiah chapter 8, I'm just sharing this here with you to help you to see Uh, that it is appropriate to to use the resources that we have uh, for medicinal reasons, as Paul did with Timothy, as the Samaritan or the individual did in Luke chapter 10, and now even with certain uh, uh, things that were available during this time. In Jeremiah chapter 8 and verse 22, is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then has not the health of the daughter of my people been restored? Similar language is found in Jeremiah chapter 46 and verse number 11. So what's the point of all this? Well, certainly there are times where drugs are condemned. We've seen that with Galatians chapter 5 and the use of them in certain ways and for reasons and motives behind them. We're also seeing that there are times where obviously they are appropriate. They are endorsed. They are used as well. Uh, drugs bought or prescribed or given for the use of medicinal purposes are appropriate. Um, some have questions about CBD, and honestly, I didn't know a lot about this until uh, studying and getting some insight from others. But CBD is something that is non-psychoactive and not addictive in nature. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details about this, but what I did learn, people have questions about CBD and how should we respond to that. Um, according to the World Health Organization, it's something that is non-psychoactive and not addictive. Now, if you smoke marijuana to get the benefits of CBD, you're exposing yourself to the risk of marijuana addiction when you could just use the CBD without that risk. So there's a distinction to be made, assuming that one believes that there is actually benefit with things like CBD that are now available in different places. So, People ask the question, is it okay for us to use drugs? Well, certainly, we have a a surgery. We have some kind of medication that's given to us in the hospital. Uh, We have drugs sometimes for the use of depression, cholesterol, high blood pressure, a variety of reasons. We have over-the-counter medication as well. And we see examples, not just in the Old, but also in the New Testament, about individuals turning to things like wine and other drugs for the sake of medicinal purposes. Now, maybe the biggest question is, okay, what about drugs for recreational use? What about drugs for recreational use? I like what one person wrote. The Bible does not directly express prohibitions against cocaine, heroin, ecstasy, MDA, MDMA, or meth. There's no mention in the Bible about marijuana, peyote, magic mushrooms, or acid like LSD. Nothing is said about huffing, snorting, dropping, smoking, vaping, shooting, licking, or any other method of ingestion. That's what a lot of people are engaged in. But that does not mean that we don't have direction. It doesn't mean that we don't have principles. 
It doesn't mean that we don't have instructions from God about how to even navigate a subject like this. So what might be some principles? Young people, if you're not taking notes, I want you to take notes or write in your Bible or really hold on to this. Or I'll give you my outline afterwards. These are things that you're going to have to consider and decisions you're going to have to make, not just in high school, but also in college and for that matter, throughout your life. There are principles that we need to think about when it comes to recreational use of drugs. Let's begin, number one, with the laws of the land. If we just ask ourselves, okay, should we be taking or using recreational drugs? A lot of young people and older people, for that matter, are doing that. Many, if not most of the things I just mentioned, are going to go or be contrary to the law of the land. And we are to be subject to the law of the land, to the authorities. In Matthew chapter 22 and verse number 21, Jesus is going to say uh, when he was uh, having an interaction, render to Caesar what belongs to him. So Jesus submitted himself at that time to the authority and the laws at that time. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Look over in Titus chapter 3. In Titus chapter 3, and there's some other well-known passages we probably think of when we start thinking about the authority or the government and laws and th different things like that that are in place. As we answer the question about drugs for recreational use, well, number one, we have to submit to the rulers and authorities. In Titus chapter 3 and verse number 1, Paul says, remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. The simple fact of taking many of these drugs that people do today, they are illegal in nature. They're illegal. And so by doing so, now we're breaking uh, the laws of the land and we're being disobedient to what God has told us in his word. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse number 13, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 13, Peter says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority, or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God, that by doing right you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men, and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Other passages like Romans chapter 13 certainly tell us with respect to how we are to view the, the governing authorities in Romans chapter 13. We are to be in subjection to them, to the governing authorities. Romans 13 and verse 1, For there is no authority except from God, and those who exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation upon themselves. So we have instruction from the Bible, not just emotional arguments or think so's about, okay, well, number one, to work through and process, should I be consuming these drugs in a recreational sense? There's no need for medicine, uh, but maybe from peer pressure, uh, letting loose, uh, experimenting? Well, the answer to that is no. Now, with respect to the laws of the land, it's also important because people sometimes, well, you know, uh, what if they contradict what the Word of God says? Well, certainly, uh, the only time we violate the laws of the land or do not follow them is when these laws violate divine Scripture. Uh, Daniel continued to pray in Daniel chapter 6, even though there was a decree of not to pray for those 30 days. Paul or Peter and the other apostles continued to preach in Acts chapter 5 and verse 29, even though they were told to no longer preach Jesus. And so certainly, uh, as long as these laws, and they're not with respect to these drugs, in con conflict with God's word, we are to be in subjection to the governing authorities. That's one principle to think about, but there's more. Secondly, as you think about recreational drugs, we're to be good stewards of our bodies, managers, stewards. Uh, not, and you could add to this money. Uh, drugs cost a lot of money. I think they do, right? But it's going to be a waste of money where you're ingesting something that is going to hinder you, hinder your walk and hinder your thinking, hinder your influence in the cause of Christ. We're to be good stewards of our bodies. Now, this is not exactly parallel, but with the, 
with the parable of the, of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. We won't read that. But Jesus, or God, is looking for us to be wise with what He's given us. We are to be good stewards with what God has given us. Sometimes the argument may be, well, there are Christians and nations where laws of the land may allow for certain drug use or certain drugs for recreational use. They are legal. Well, just because they're legal does not mean that we still go down that path. That ultimately is still not our standard for what we will do or will not do. Does that make sense? Our standard is always going to be God and what he says in his word. So even if things are legal, accessible, available, that's still not the standard to say, well, the law of the land says this. The law of the land says a lot, but it doesn't mean that it's right in the eyes of God. And so we need to start thinking about, from the sake of being a good steward or manager of our bodies, drugs affect our bodies. Drugs affect our bodies physically, mentally, emotionally, most of the time for the worse. I was reminded of that with that phone call last year. When I was in Seattle, there was a brother in Christ in Bible class. He said that he's been 100 days free from drugs, and everybody rejoiced. You talk to that man, he's not telling you or endorsing drugs. He's celebrating the fact that he hasn't had to turn to them for 100 days, that he's avoided them. So we need to be good stewards of what God has given us with our bodies, with our time, and even with our finances. Thirdly, James talks about how we can easily deceive ourselves. First John talks about how we can deceive ourselves. Here's the reality. When we start talking about drugs and using them for recreational use at college parties or even high school or maybe even younger these days, or at the work and at the job, you know, Hollywood often um, glamorizes the use of drugs. Well, we need to be very careful that we are not deceiving ourselves. We can think and convince ourselves that we can actually handle these substances. And a lot of people, sadly, have learned the hard way that they can become addictive the very first time. And even worse, they can die. We can have the, the Samson mentality of, well, I'll, get, I'll escape like I did last time. Or I can handle this and now I'll be able to get away. And oftentimes that just does not happen. We also need to remember our enemy. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 5. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. And this will lead us into our next thought. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse number 8. Paul, I'm sorry, Peter is writing to Christians, but he also reminds them, or and he reminds them, about their enemy, right? Who is our true enemy? Well, it's Satan. In 1 Peter 5 and verse 8, Peter says, Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around, like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is so important, especially for, for young individuals as well. You may tell yourself, well, I, I can handle marijuana. I can handle you know, some of the drugs or some of the things that my uh, peers are asking me to do or maybe to celebrate after a big win or uh, something like that. I did that at times in college. I'm not proud of it, but I'll share it. And uh, many of us have done the same thing. You know, after a big exam, I was thinking about physiology when I had that class. It was a five-hour class. And we would go to the bars and relax after a big exam, kind of relax and let loose a little bit. But we can deceive ourselves. And that kind of behavior was not appropriate. It was wrong. But we can deceive ourselves thinking, I can handle this. I know when to stop. I'm not like that person there. I know how to say no. Well, there's a lot of people who've had those thoughts as well. And they're not here to tell you about it today because they went farther than they ever thought they would be. But notice what Peter says in verse 8 again. Be of sober spirit. Be on the alert. I want you to think about this. This answers, I believe, many questions, if not all the questions with respect to recreational use of drugs, were to be sober-minded. I want you to put that to memory. We are to be sober-minded. Peter is saying, be sober. Be sober. Be of a sober spirit. Be on the alert. First of all, drugs, are they going to help us to be on the alert against the evil one? We know the answer to that. 
Secondly, he says, be sober. We are to be sober-minded. You look up different definitions in sober, the idea to abstain from wine, to be calm, collective in spirit, temperate, self-controlled, dispassionate, not impacted by strong feelings or emotions, or warped or composed, and circumspect, heedful, prudent, attentive. Be sober-minded. Paul addresses sorcery and witchcraft in Galatians 5. We have examples of medicinal purposes for benefiting our bodies. And now with respect to recreational use, we are to be sober-minded. That answers the question, no, we should not go down this path with respect to drugs. It is fascinating. We just saw one example here in 1 Peter chapter 5. Let me share with you a couple of more examples about the people that we are supposed to be and what you can even share your friends and family members as to why you're going to abstain from using drugs. 1 Peter chapter 1, Peter reminds us about the person that we're supposed to be. In 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to notice in verses 13 through 16, four thoughts that Peter reminded these Christians of who they were supposed to be. It applies to us. Verse 13, therefore, and he's been talking about salvation. Salvation in Jesus, what is to come in the context. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober, there's that word, keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace of to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Drugs are not going to help us to keep our minds focused and our hope completely on the grace of God. As obedient children, verse 14, do not be conformed to the former lust which were yours in your ignorance. Now we know better, so we don't go back to that previous kind of conduct. And drugs are going to fall under to the the lusts of the flesh and what they often do and give and provide for people for a temporary amount of time. But we don't go back to that kind of behavior. But like the Holy One, verse 15, who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior, because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Four thoughts that he says. Number one, he's saying this is who you're supposed to be. Be sober. You see that? Number two, stay focused. Number three, live right. And number four, be holy. Now, how will drugs help us to accomplish any of those things that Jesus or Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, is telling us to be? They won't. And so that's reason for us, this idea of being sober-minded. We need to be sober-minded so our mind can actually focus on the things that God wants us to do. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse number 7, and Peter, I believe, is going to answer the question with alcohol as well in this context when he talks about drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, three different terms to kind of cover the whole aspect of drinking. Not kind of, he does. In verse 7, he says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be of sound judgment, here it is, and sober spirit for the purpose of prayer. That's who we're supposed to be. And drugs are certainly not going to help us to accomplish this. Being sober-minded is how we can be victorious over the devil. Being sober-minded is how we can be victorious over the devil. Remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15. In verse number 34, the context here is there were some who said that there is no resurrection. Paul talks about the implications of that. If there is no resurrection, then what do we do with Jesus, who indeed has been raised from the dead? He says in verse number 33 of 1 Corinthians 15, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought. So it's not a mere suggestion. This is who we are supposed to be. Become sober-minded and stop sinning. For some have no knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. We are to be sober-minded. Our minds are to be fixed on things above, not on things below. Drugs are certainly not going to help us to accomplish those things. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and again, I'm talking about recreational use. There are certain occasions where we have to use drugs for medicinal purposes. I'm not talking about that situation here. 
but I'm talking about the way that most people, many, use and abuse drugs in their lives. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul, as he wraps up this first letter, he says, But you, in verse 4, brethren, are not in darkness, that the day would overtake you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. We're to be alert and sober. Jesus can return and will return like a thief in the night. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night. And those who get drunk get drunk at night. We know how true that is, don't we? Now that's not all the time. Some people get drunk in the day, but most get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, self-controlled. Let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Paul told Timothy to be sober in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 5. Sobriety, that is what we are supposed to be. We are to be sober-minded. We are to be on the alert. We are to be temperate. We are to have self-control. And again, these are not mere suggestions or options. It's exactly who we're supposed to be. Do you see that? So, yes, there are times where drugs are used, and I believe we have authority for those for medicinal purposes. Many of us are on some for good reason, and it's appropriate. But when it comes to recreational use or to numb the pain of different things that we're going through or peer pressure, no, we need to stay away from that. That's only going to get us into trouble. It, it goes against what God says to be sober. So I'm not trying to take this lightly here, but the call to action is be sober. And so we're, if we go down a path that's causing us to lose our sobriety, well, now we are going against what God says in his word. So what about alcohol? Well, again, just remember everything we just said about being sober-minded. The command to be sober is reason for us to abstain from alcohol. We are to be sober-minded, and this would fall into alcohol as well. In fact, if you're reading along in these verses, you see many examples with respect to alcohol. You go back to the uh, works of the flesh. In Galatians chapter 5, you have drunkenness, uh, you have carousing. That entails alcohol. That entails this idea of letting loose, uh, being half drunk, reveling. That's the idea in, the, in Galatians chapter 5. And we see this term found throughout the New Testament as well. So we know, number one, that the Bible um, condemns drunkenness. If you look over in Luke chapter 21, in verse 34, listen to what Jesus has to say here. In Luke chapter 21, in verse number 34, Jesus says, Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed, weighted down with dissipation and drunkenness and the worries of life, and that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. We are to avoid drunkenness. In Romans chapter 13, Romans chapter 13, in verse number, verses 11 through 13, notice what Paul says here. And Paul is driving at our conduct, who we are to be as the people of God. Romans 13, beginning in verse number 11, he says, Do this knowing the time that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in that day. As in the day. So he's telling us, here's your conduct. Here's how you behave properly as Christians. Not in carousing and drunkenness. Those are the same words from Galatians 5 with the works of the flesh and 1 Peter 4. Not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality. Not in strife and jealousy. More works of the flesh. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice this. Here's another good argument. And make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. Make no provision for the flesh. Well, that will help us when sometimes people want to know, all right, well, how far down the road or the path can I go? Well, Paul is saying, you make no provision for the flesh. That would include drugs, that would include alcohol. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul reminded the saints of who they used to be. 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. I read this this morning, beginning in verse number 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. We can deceive ourselves, but do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The New Testament is clear about this. And sometimes people ask the question, what about a little? Maybe sometimes we're asking the wrong question. Why any at all? Maybe a better question. We're to be holy. We're to be sober. We're to fix our hope on things above. We're to be different. So why begin or go down that path at all? We're to remember who we're supposed to be. Peter addresses this specifically in 1 Peter chapter 4. In 1 Peter chapter 4, read with me please beginning in verse number 1. 1 Peter chapter 4 beginning in verse number 1. 1 Peter 4 beginning in verse number 1. We are to be sober minded. That's a command. That's a reason for us to say no. We know that the Bible denounces drunkenness. And we also know that we're to redeem the time. That there should be a, a difference between us and the world. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for the lust of men, but for the will of God. How will drinking and, and drugs, but here specifically with alcohol, how is that going to help us to accomplish the will of God? For the time already past is sufficient for you to have carried out the desire of the Gentiles. You see, this is what the world used to do, or not used to do. This is exactly what the world does. Having pursued a course, it's a path, it's a journey, it's a habit, it's a practice, a course of sensuality, lust, drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. You see, that's what the world used to do, and quite frankly, that's what some of the brethren that Peter's writing to used to do as well. Because he says in verse 4, In all this they are surprised that you do not run with them. That should be happening in our lives where people see a distinction between us and them. And to the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. But they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Drinking is not going to help us to redeem the time. It's not going to help us to accomplish the will of God. We are new creatures in Christ. Young people, I want to challenge you with this as well. That why go down that path at all? We're to redeem the time. That's not going to help you to do the will of God. And secondly, don't put yourself in a tempting situation. We say, well, I, I would never do that. Be careful with what you say when you say, I will never do that. A lot of people have said, I would never get divorced, and they're divorced. I would never do that, and they go down that very path that they say they would never do. God provides a way of escape for us from temptations according to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. So let us not voluntarily put ourselves in a tempting situation like a drinking party or other social event. I understand we can go to places, you go to a restaurant, there's going to be a bar. And you go to a sporting event, there's going to be alcohol that's going to be sold. But we still have to have self-control. But there are certain other occasions where the pressure is much, much heavier. And you guys know what I'm talking about. Don't put yourself in a situation to see how much can I actually handle. Well, that's unwise, and you're setting yourself up for failure. So we don't want to tempt ourselves or put ourselves in a t situation and then say, God, help me out of this. Don't go down that path to begin with. So not only that, but we're not to engage in the works of the flesh. We've already spent a good amount of time talking about this. Drunkenness, carousing, all falls into the, dr uh, into the works of the flesh. One definition of carousing, a nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity. 
And they sing and play before the houses of their male and female friends. Hence, use generally a feast and drinking parties that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. Three terms. Drunkenness, carousing, drinking parties in First Peter chapter 4. Peter says, no, we don't do that any longer. That's who we used to be, but we no longer go down that path. That's reason to abstain. We are to be sober-minded. We are to be different from the world. We are to be transformed. Our minds are, are to be renewed with the Word of God. In Romans chapter 12, Paul reminds us who we are and how we are to present ourselves to God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. These kinds of actions are not going to help us to do that. We are told in Ephesians 5 and verse 18 to walk carefully, to walk circumspectly as being wise, to not engage in the fruits of darkness, but rather to expose them according to Galatians chapter 5. And I want you to notice again the contrast that Paul is going to make here in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18. We are to be under the control of the Holy Spirit, not under the control of some other kind of substance like alcohol. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 18, excuse me, I should have started in verse 15. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So to not get drunk with wine... We're going to have to make a choice about even going down that path to begin with. Don't get drunk with wine. Don't, go, don't begin that process. But rather be filled with the Holy Spirit. We are to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. We are to be sober-minded at all times. We are to be on the alert. And so we walk carefully and not foolishly. We walk according to the Holy Spirit. When we engage in the lust of the flesh... We're not listening, we're not being led, we're not living, and we're not listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say. As you think about alcohol as well, sometimes people turn to alcohol and drugs for that matter because they don't know how to process emotional pain. And so we use these buffers to numb ourselves, to ignore the reality of where we may be in our lives, to say I can't face what I'm currently, what's currently you know, confronting me. And so they turn to alcohol as a source or as an outlet to, to, to avoid pain, as a refuge. But that's not who we're supposed to turn to. We're supposed to turn to God. God is to be our refuge. I love Psalm chapter 4 because David knew where he was supposed to turn to. And a lot of people struggle with this because we don't know how to sometimes process what's happening in our lives. We don't know how to move forward. And sometimes we just do what maybe we've seen in our family before. I see that, I've seen that in my own family. We don't know how to cry sometimes or handle disappointment and there's a lot of pain that was not resolved and so there's something else that's going to make us feel better, at least temporarily, so let me go down and use that in, instead. In peace, Psalm 4 and verse 8, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O Lord, make me to dwell in safety. In the midst of suffering, where did David turn to? You know, he turned to God. He turned to the Lord. And we have to learn how to do that as well and not turn to drugs or alcohol for the sake of our refuge or to be able to just to kind of get through the day. Our bodies are to be the temple of God and that would entail not just with respect to a sexual immorality but just how we use our bodies. We have been bought with a price according to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 19. We belong to God, and He is the one that dictates to us what we do with our bodies. We are to be sober-minded. That's why we don't go down this path of drinking. And these principles are principles that we can understand and follow 
and share with others. Well, how come you don't drink? I remember when I worked with Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, and there was a time I used to drink. There was a time I, I would have social drinks just to kind of fit in, to relieve stress after a big college exam. But people ask, how come you no longer drink? And I had to give them an answer. And we shouldn't be ashamed of what the Bible has to say about why we no longer drink or consume alcohol. There are plenty of reasons. We are to be sober-minded. To be sober-minded, brothers and sisters, it changes everything. That's what we're called to be. That's not a suggestion. That's not just some mere option. We are to be sober-minded. And that's the reason for us to abstain. To say no. As we think about the commandments of Jesus... People say, well, I don't know. Is that actually possible for me to be sober-minded? The answer is yes. Because Jesus says, take my yoke upon you. My yoke is easy and not burdensome. My yoke is light. The way of the world is heavy. And our own thought process and decision-making will take us down a path we never want to go. And so as you think about drugs and alcohol, these are some principles, instructions, commands that the Bible has given us in answering this question. And we need to take these words seriously. Paul warned the brethren twice. As I have forewarned you, I forewarn you again. These kinds of practices and habits, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we need to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And we need to walk according to what God says in His Word. Let us be sober in all that we do. Now, if you have more questions about this, please let me know. We're going to stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate you being here tonight. And sometimes there may be some more questions. There's certainly more things that we could talk about. But if you have more questions, please let me know. Maybe there's someone here. I did a sermon this morning. We talked about baptism this morning. Uh, someone came up to me after services she's thinking about being baptized and we need to pray for our young people that they will respond to the gospel message maybe there's someone here who needs to put on christ you haven't done it yet and now is your time we want you to be able to see through the blur and see through the blur of drugs and alcohol and what the world teaches and listen to what god has to say if you have questions about your salvation about how to be saved now is your time if you are subject to the invitation, come now as we stand and as we sing. I heard